Because it's for kids. It, like, uh, they, 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 they probably think the bar is very, very low. I mean, they already think the bar, you've seen PragerU videos, Big Joel, come on. You know how low the bar is. It, it, it's basically just like, hey, you know how you've heard about systemic racism? Well, guess what? It's not. I'm Dave Rubin for PragerU. Today, I want to talk about the Finger You series of educational children's videos, The Adventures of Leo and Layla. The show is about two siblings, Leo and Layla, who hop around time and learn history lessons. And in this video, I just want to look at some of this iconic and beautifully animated and well-acted <laughs> children's media. Boy, I sure wish I could have met Ronald Reagan. Well, why can't you? Because he passed away. Middle so let's start boys, here yeah. with the first episode that really caught my eye. Leo and Layla's adventures with Galileo. Leo is working on his science homework, getting a vinegar volcano to erupt, but something's not right. He's following the directions, but the volcano isn't doing anything. He calls in his sister, Layla, and she claims that the point of science is to go by the book. I've always thought that being a scientist is all about carefully following instructions. Mm. You know how you hear trust the science all the time. Then they go back in time and have their by little the minds Party. absolutely rocked by Galileo. He says that while yes, careful attention to details and following steps is important, science is about skepticism, coming to different conclusions and not accepting dogmatic authority. Science is both a collection of steps and rules from past experiments, and also a never ending process of questioning and testing. Leo and Layla then go back to their time with this knowledge in mind. Leo changes the recipe for his volcano and gets good results. In the background, we hear a television personality say the phrase, trust the science, and the siblings exchange a knowing glance. Government officials. Oh, not just Prager, you kids. If you didn't hear, apparently Daily Wire said, because they're so pissed off at Disney. This is a weird time, by the way. Disney is both putting money or did put money into funding a bunch of politicians that passed the Don't Say Gay bill. Well, at the same time, the Disney brand seems to be really interested in having this kind of corporate rainbow uh, branding aspect. So they want the LGBTQIA plus community to feel very, very safe with Disney. And so because of that, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of like, hey, Disney's going to have a lot more gay characters and just going to be more representation and you're going to love it and it's going to be splendid and because of that the republicans are now taking it and they're like disney has gone woke full woke you know at first they were flirting with the wokeness so we, we were wondering when they would actually you know make a move and go all the all the woke way but they've done it disney has done it so Daily Wire, American. I think it's I think it's 100 million. I think Daily Wire said, well, they announced they're going to spend like 100 million dollars on making children's content. But that that sucks. Like we've now got two massive and very rich outfits, PragerU and uh, what is it, um, Daily Wire Kids, whatever that's going to be. I don't know. It's if it's going to be them making more shitty kids movies, uh, or sorry, more shitty movies, then maybe it won't be all bad. Who have questions? Not yeah, to Disney's worry. managed to piss off everyone. everyone. Just needs to follow the steps they've been given and trust the science. Hmm. So this video is a great intro to Leo and Layla because it's just unbelievably insane in a completely obvious way. They're using Galileo as a political cudgel against vaccine science, and it simply makes no sense at all. Like, are random conservative anti-vaxxers doing the science? Are they conducting clinical studies on vaccines? Do they even read the relevant yes. scientific literature, the studies yes. that have been conducted, etc.? No, right? at least not for the most part, to compare them to Galileo is uh, truly depraved. You know, a common refrain for PragerU is that appreciation for the classics is dead. Everyone now is learning about politics and racism and Marxism in university now and not even enjoying the thick, beautiful words of Shakespeare. To get a bachelor's degree in Pretty English thick. literature at the University of California at Los Angeles, one of the most prestigious colleges in America, you must take courses in gender, race, ethnicity, disability, or sexuality studies, in imperial, Base. transnational, or post-colonial studies, Base. and in critical theory. But you are not Base. required to take a single course in Shakespeare. So, hey, by the way, everybody, I'm an expertise on this topic. I have a degree in English literature. That's right, I have a Bachelor of Arts. I'm an educated man, a Harvard man. 
in that I did not go to Harvard because I can't afford it. But I am an, I'm an educated man uh, in that. Uh, but I will say, in terms of English literature, uh, this would have been so much better. <laughs> this would have been, I would have loved this. <laughs> you know how many shitty courses I had to take? How many shitty fucking dry poetry courses I had to take? Worthless. Worthless. Hours. I can't even tell you a single thing that I learned. Garbage. Just blather. There's, there was like two good courses I ever took at university. One of them uh, was children's literature, and that's where I got to read a whole bunch of children's books that I'd never read before, I never grew up with, and some of them uh, I didn't know were such powerful Christian allegories, like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but now I do know, and, and things of that nature. That was fun. That was interesting. And then the other one was on non-white literature, where I actually got to expand my mind grapes and go out to read things by indigenous authors, by black authors, all this kind of stuff, right? So, so those were the two good classes I took, and that was about it. Maybe the one on Dante's Inferno was kind of fun, but still, only because there's so much fucked up shit that happens in Dante's, but it's mostly, it's garbage. It really is. I took a course, I took, I literally took a course on Shakespeare in university. I took a two or three hundred level university Shakespeare course. I have been in that class. I do like Shakespeare. I, I, I enjoyed reading Shakespeare. That's why I took it. I'm, I'm quite a big fan of that. Do you know what my final, my final exam was? We had to perform a Shakespeare play. Like, I, I had to memorize, and trust me, memorizing Shakespeare is very hard. It's very hard. I had to do The Taming of the Shrew, and I can't remember, I can't even remember any of the lines now. None of it. It's one of those, like, you just, you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night, walking, pacing around a room, just being like, Oh, doeth dearest, thou shalt knoweth the, ah, oh, no, okay, sorry. Oh, doeth dearest, thou shalt, ah, uh, <laughs> and like, that's, like, I, I stand in defiance of this statement saying, yeah, enjoy Shakespeare, sure, study it, right? But in terms of the amount of knowledge, practical and or understanding of the world around me, Shakespeare teaches you about whimsy, beauty, folly, love, things like that. All incredible, amazing things. I'm not here to bash Shakespeare. Shakespeare has some very incredibly uh, timeless plays. Fine. Um, but I would have loved to have taken this kind of stuff. And especially if it was a requirement. Are you kidding me? None of this was a requirement. I didn't have to take courses on race, on disabilities, on sexual sexuality studies, imperial, transnational, or post-colonial studies. No. My friends who actually were smart and went to history got to do that kind of stuff. This point has always been ridiculous, and I've talked about it before, but... So you paid to have people tell you to read books that you didn't want to. Yes. For, for a lot of those classes, yes. Especially classes related... Because, like... It's, it's, the other thing is that there's like, there is so much competition to get into universities, way worse now than it ever was when I was, when I was a lad. Um, and there's a lot of people that try to get into all these courses. So a lot of the good courses you might want to take, they fill up. So you have to take garbage courses. So I'm like, okay, what's this one? Frost. Uh, okay, that sounds fun. What's it going to be? Oh, it's about the poems by Frost. And you're like, oh. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with this individual, but I, I would like to be... The, oh, my God. Are you fucking... I have to do this for, for six months? Six months of this? Are you fucking kidding me? It is particularly surreal in light of this kid's video. PragerU is breaking into the homeschool market. That's why Leo and Layla exist. Every PragerU video now comes with a sheet oh, of Antonicus questions is my a child can fill play. out. It, it, and that, for a $25 yearly donation, a parent can gain access to PrEP, a discussion forum for teachers and parents. And here, we can see very clearly what PragerU's actual educational priorities are and how exactly they see the classics. Galileo is thrown in. He insinuates... Can I just say this? This is kind of wild because simultaneously, conservatives, they're really planning for the future here. They want an entire like generation from childhood on to be right wing hardcore capitalists, neoliberal capitalists. Like that's that's basically what they're trying to do here. And that's a lot of foresight. That's like, you know what, this will really pay off in about twenty to thirty years. That's that's a big old investment. While at the same time, they don't believe in things like climate change. Like, I, I don't understand that. that. That's a lot of foresight to see into that, like, be like, oh, yeah, this will be great. We'll have so many Republicans, so many more conservatives, so many more, you know, right-leaning libertarians. Anyways, to the kids about how they shouldn't trust vaccine science because he went against church authority and we move the fuck on. His entire being and significance is burnt at the pyre of whatever petty political issue conservatives care about this year. So when I learn new things that are different from what is taught in school, some people think that I'm rebelling against government authority and going against God. 
are you? So this is our baseline Leo and Layla video. They have some belief or some petty grievance they want to air, and they find some historical figure they can clumsily pretend exemplifies that belief. And with that standard in mind, let's see how odd and thought-provoking and, at times, disgusting that format can become. Let's talk about the most interesting Leo and Layla video that I saw. It's about Paul Revere. From a formal <laughs> perspective, this is genuinely one of the most complicated bits of work PragerU has ever produced, and that's clear from the minute you watch it. See, I said this was a video about Paul Revere, that's what it's called, but strangely, that's not who the kids talk to. Rather, they go back in time and talk to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the man who wrote the famous poem, Paul Revere's Ride, about his alerting the Americans that the British are coming during a night ride. For over 100 years, hmm. children your age read my poems in schools across America. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Oh my God, this, this choice is, is interesting, I think. Leo and Leo. Yeah, interesting and horrifying. What the fuck? What is this children of the corn shit? <laughs> <laughs> Layla have never titled a video after something other than its main subject before. But I think this choice works in a pretty clever way to get at a point that's obviously important to PragerU. To explain how, let's start by talking about Wadsworth's poem, Paul Revere's Ride. Wadsworth wrote his poem in 1860, essentially on the eve of the Civil War. He was a staunch abolitionist and he wanted the North to think in terms of the Union, the urgency of this time. Wadsworth got the general idea right in his poem. Paul Revere did go on a night ride to alert American soldiers that the British were coming. But of course, he made embellishments. Revere never got to Concord, he was captured during his night ride, and he never shouted the British are coming, things like that. Paul Revere's actual ride is surprisingly <laughs> well documented, and so we know that these changes are artistic, creative, meant to produce a particular narrative. Yeah, you now, sell the legend. none of this information makes Longfellow or his work bad. I am not canceling Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. But it does make this Leo and Layla cartoon a bit strange, right? This video is about the importance of myth. It's a celebration of the threads that pervade our culture culture, the stories that bind a nation together. It has brought Americans great pride to have such a heroic story to celebrate and to have a hero like Paul Revere. When people have a shared history, it brings them closer together and unites them. But here, the mythmaker Longfellow is rendered interchangeable with the subject of his myth, Revere. To learn about Paul Revere is to learn what Longfellow had to say about him in his celebratory poem. And this conflation between the two men goes so deep that neither Leo nor Layla think it's particularly strange that they typed Paul Revere into their time-traveling phone and got a different person altogether. See, PragerU is not merely invested in myth as cultural object, as a series of fictional accounts that nonetheless give us a sense of national unity. No, we must believe them, present them as historical information indistinguishable from reality. In other words, PragerU doesn't just want us to know this poem, they want to literally redefine what a fact is, how we come into knowledge about the world. That Longfellow wrote something, that what he wrote was and is politically expedient to PragerU's patriotic message is the highest form of evidence that could exist. And Leo and Layla, these students of history, are literally there to collect that kind of evidence. They, like the audience of this cartoon are not witness to the thing itself, cannot see the man Paul Revere. No, they are only recipients of his derivative, his shadow, the ways we can politicize him. Put simply, these kids have a time machine and it does not work. How odd is that? Okay, let's talk about what is probably the most famous and horrible Leo and Layla cartoon, the one about Frederick Douglass. The episode starts with Leo- I think we've watched that one. Leo and Layla lounging on the couch, just vibing and 100% enjoying each other's company. Things are so weird right now. I know. They're watching the news, and what they see is chatter about violent BLM activists advocating for police abolition. Well, Clint, these local activists want to abolish the police. They're claiming systematic oppression and want the U.S. system torn down. 
What is going on? I know. Wanting to learn more about abolition, the two go back in time and talk to Frederick, a famous slave abolitionist. And he kinda writhes around and tells them the deal. We're trying to learn about activism and abolishing things. Can you help us? Yes, he thinks abolishing slavery is good, but that it's nevertheless essential to always work within the system. I'm certainly not okay with slavery, but the Founding Fathers made a compromise to achieve something great, the making of the United States. When the Founding Fathers began this country, they created the incredible constitution and believed that slavery would end gradually, and we should just kinda stick to that. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas concludes by talking about his abolitionist ex-friend William Lloyd Garrison. They stopped being friends apparently because Garrison was a violent radical who would burn things if he didn't get his way. William refuses all compromises, demands immediate change, and if he doesn't get what he wants, he likes to set things on fire. Sounds familiar. And just to be clear, <laughs> what PragerU means by burning things is the Constitution, which Garrison famously burned. So, okay, uh, let's just begin here by breaking down the number of obvious ways in which this video is batshit insane. Yeah, and before he does that, I also want to say one of the scary things about the whole PragerU kids and then whatever's going to be pre uh, Daily Wire kids and all this kind of stuff is that it does seem like they are doing this also as a response to the idea that more people are trying to teach everyday Americans about real American history about the history of like the genocide of indigenous people, about the history of slavery, things like that. And, and that's kind of creeping into places like the workplace and stuff like that. So now they're like, well, why don't we kind of polish over some of the more yikesy things? You know, we can we can definitely say slavery was bad. Slavery was bad. And, and we're not going to tell you that it was a good thing, right? But we are going to tell you that there's slight differences to what you may have heard and everything's not as bad. And did you know? Did you know that white people also freed the slaves? Ah, checkmate. Checkmate, you see. It'll take a while, but it is important, I think. First off, you might notice a word that's missing from this video, and that word is civil war. And doesn't the civil war just immediately defeat this argument that. entirely? PragerU talks about the beauty of working within the system and constitution, its hatred of radical force used to achieve just ends. But ultimately, in the real world, peaceful reform, the constitution, did not end slavery, not at all. In fact, in 1856, the Supreme Court, led by Justice Taney, made its famous Dred Scott decision, decided that runaway slaves who crossed state lines had to be given back to their owners even if the state they went to forbid slavery. That is what our interpretations of the Constitution did. That was working within the system. Look, the bloodiest moment in American history was fought because the South wanted to keep their slaves. It was a war that changed everything, the shape of America. America, its politics. So to pretend that abolition came as a result of working peacefully and gradually is simply ridiculous. Let's change our sights to Frederick Douglass because what this video turns him into is genuinely repulsive. Yes, Frederick Douglass did believe that the Constitution forbids slavery, and he wanted to convince people of the same. He said as much after the Dred Scott decision. Neither in the preamble nor in the body of the Constitution is there a single mention of the term slave or slaveholder, slave master or slave state. Neither is there any reference to the color or the physical peculiarities of any part of the people of the United States. But to read into this, a kind of fetishistic love of the process just is not correct. I knew the U.S. Constitution would survive and allow for positive change. Frederick Douglass was a politician who wanted desperately, more than anything, to see slaves be freed. That meant he wanted to make arguments that people would agree with, use existing American political ideology to encourage change. But he was also furious with America, in America that saw him and his race as subhuman, a country that shows comfort and industry and the status quo over justice. 
Yes, he wanted to change people's minds with the Constitution, but he also believed in a defensive and radical violence against the evil of slavery. He believed that violent resistance to slave catchers was wise as well as just. He said of John Brown, a man who attempted a violent slave insurrection and was executed, his zeal in the cause of freedom was infinitely superior to mine. Mine was a taper light, his was the burning sun, mine was bounded by time, his stretched away to the silent shores of eternity. I could speak for the slave, John Brown could fight for the slave. I could live for the slave, John Brown could die for the slave. How beautiful is that? What an incredible writer. John Brown is, at least according to PragerU, a radical. So there you go. <laughs> Douglas was pretty sympathetic to radicals. And, you know, can you imagine if Douglas was truly yeah, flat out Brown. against these things? He it did a really good John Brown. a hypocrite and a freak. And that's because Douglas was a slave. I'm like, I don't know if the real John Brown was quite that uh, screamy. But uh, yeah, he's, he's really good in that show. It's a, it's, it's a very entertaining series. I'm not sure if PragerU knows this, but that was actually legal in the United States at the time, and he broke the law by escaping, forcefully ceasing his own bondage. You can't say the law is sacrosanct and we need only reform the system for thee, but not for me. It just doesn't make any sense. So, looking at all this, my only question here is why. Like, zooming out, the point of this video isn't related to slavery or Frederick Douglass. No, it's about police abolition, BLM rioters, that's what Leo and Layla wanted to learn about, right? But that just doesn't make any sense to me. For one thing, this video says nothing about the notion of police abolition. In fact, it seems about as pro-abolishing the police as it is pro-abolishing slavery. As long as we all act within the bounds of the law and the constitution, Constitution, we're fine, I guess. A baffling claim for PragerU to make. So, I guess the video is exclusively about BLM violence then, how people shouldn't break things, even for justice. But to this, I can only say, are you fucking uh, kidding me? <laughs> Prager you thinking that violent protest is bad has got to be one of their most boring takes, one that is deeply agreeable to their audience. And to make that point here, for some reason, they feel like they have to compare current BLM protesters to slave abolitionists before the Civil War. Can you imagine an argument that would make these people look better, more noble, more righteous? I literally can't. This whole video feels like a long, absurd, unnecessary walk for a tiny drink of PragerU water. But see, I think what I just said is the wrong way to go about looking at this work, almost too charitable. Like the video wanted to be about how we should never do violent protest, and they made a really strange bad- Hey, what up, bothered boy? Uh, yo, surfs. First off, hi. Second, YouTuber Doki Doki Discourse has a really good video about Prager Your Kids. The other video is Prager You on the right. Sweet. I will check it out. Bad argument for Doki that Doki point. Discourse. But in the end, this logic obscures what the video is actually about power. It is about the way power ought to work in a literal sense, how all social change must be controlled by a divinely ordained class of individuals. While it might be shocking to see a conservative think tank make this comparison, modern day BLM protesters and slave abolitionists are actually identical as far as PragerU is concerned. That's made evident from their line about how Garrison burned things if he didn't get his way. These two groups are the same because their opinions and desires desires are equally irrelevant. Disdain for the system, demand for drastic change, is always bad, and that's true no matter who you are or how important your cause is. The video is about power over history. Because the Founding Fathers are deities, mythological figures, all of the world must logically conspire to prove them right. Oh, and according yeah. to PragerU, that's- Hey Trevbot, thank you for the rating party of four. Everyone go to twitch.tv slash tread Trevbot underscore exe. Appreciate it. And also go to youtube.com slash bothered boy while you're here as well. That's what Douglas did. Observe that. 
Breeze. Layla, your America where people are free and everyone is equal under the law sounds pretty great. At any rate, uh, let's move on and talk about another video that I just thought was a bit funny. The one where Leo and Layla go back in time and talk to Benjamin Franklin. And here, I'm really just interested in one moment. Toward the end of the video, Benjamin is trying to figure out whether the American dream is still alive and well in the future, and he asks this. Are any Americans born with fancy titles like Duke, Duchess, Lord, or King? The answer is no, of course, which is a good sign for our country. But then, something weird happens. Layla asks a question. But Mr. Franklin, even though we don't have a nobility or monarchy, some people are born into better situations than others. Does that affect the American dream? And Franklin says this. Because every human is unique, the natural outcome from equal opportunity is unequal results. Even when treated equally, people don't always end up in the same place. So this answer is obviously totally incoherent. He says that people might not have a quality of outcome, but they do have a quality of opportunity. Which produces an equality. Ah, it all makes sense now. I understand it. Man, so say it Dennis Prager and all the other people who like probably came from accrued or accumulated wealth already. Which is really cool. But Layla's question points to the fact that Americans don't have equality of opportunity, right? That's the entire point of the question. Some people are born into better situations than others. I find this moment interesting because I have to wonder, why did they even go there? Franklin got his W, right? We don't have dukes or kings in America. And this trivial win in some other case might be enough to make it seem like all is well with the American dream, that we are all free. Yet here, they choose to utterly demolish their own point. Layla drops in with facts and logic and asks a damning question of PragerU's entire political project. If this country is so invested in people being given the same opportunities, then why are some people born billionaires? It's wild, right? Why would they include such a nakedly transgressive thought? And, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe they felt that Benjamin Franklin's response was good or good enough, that his rambling non-answer would be persuasive. Because it's for kids. It, like, uh, they, 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 they probably think the bar is very, very low. I mean, they already think the bar, you've seen PragerU videos, Big Joel, come on. You know how low the bar is. It, it, it's basically just like, hey, you know how you've heard about systemic racism? Well, guess what? It's not. I'm Dave Rubin for PragerU. At least to children. That's certainly a possibility. But... Maybe they just kind of threw it in there. The person writing this video thought, that is a good question. A child might be curious about that, so let's have Layla ask. And even when they couldn't come up with any kind of answer, it just stuck around. This moment of real human curiosity, of truly imperfect propaganda. <laughs> so let's talk about one last video. <laughs> that is true. And this one's a real- <laughs> That's true. Like you've created the own crack in the armor. But you think that you sealed the crack so well with that little response that like word salad, Jordan Peterson, like weaving of like, well, we gave everyone equal opportunity, but it produces unequal outcomes. And you know what that means? And it's like, oh, OK. Well, problem solved. Leo and Layla's history adventures with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn was a Soviet novelist who criticized the USSR and Stalin and who faced repercussions for it. He was sent to a gulag for eight years and ultimately lost his citizenship. I'm not too familiar with Solzhenitsyn or his novels, so I hope you'll forgive me for largely ignoring his history. I'm far more interested here in what PragerU makes of him, the themes of this video. So what's this video about? Well, on first blush, the answer seems simple cancel culture. Leo and Layla's father spoke at a school board meeting, said that he wants to be more aware of what they're learning at school. And now everyone's freaking out, saying mean things about him and trying to get his business boycotted. People are saying really mean, crazy things about dad and trying to get the business boycotted. And this is, of course, seen as an infringement of free critic? speech, I don't know. similar to the ghost of Stalin sending Alexander to the gulag. But most likely I was afraid will of losing control of my power. You were telling the truth and I couldn't defend my bad leadership and bad ideas. So I had to shut you up. 
It's what us communists do. It's all very basic <laughs> and silly. And it's any comment that we give do. on it is something you'd have heard a billion times before. But then, toward the end of the video, Leo asks a question of Alexander. If speech is free, why can't I say whatever I want in class? Last time I got in trouble in class, I told my teacher that I shouldn't be in trouble because we live in a free country. And this is how he responds. Leo, it is very important for Americans to love and cherish your freedom because in world it is not common to be free. But it is also important to understand freedom does not mean that you are free from responsibility. When you are a student, you have a responsibility to respect your teacher and not be rude. That is interesting to me. That is what I want to focus on. Let me start unpacking this with a kind of unoriginal observation. Conservative politics is extraordinarily fixated on children. There's the rise yes. of evangelical homeschooling, the fight to change textbooks, the PragerU parenting advice to make your child obey you and never stoop down to their level. Do not bend down to the child's level. Getting a child to do what he or she is told is a matter of looking and acting and talking like you have complete confidence in your authority. The obsession with CRT, making sure kids don't think our country is or has ever been racist. The belief that trans children should not in any way have their identities taken seriously. The abstinence only sex ed. The belief that gay identities cannot be exposed to kids because their lifestyle is sinful and they are or often gender predators. Identities. And of course, we can also see this gesture in Leo's father, right? Although we don't know the details, he presumably went to this school board meeting and tried to angrily stop them from teaching something he didn't want taught. He just said he thought parents should know what teachers teach us. So, what's going on there? Why do we so often see this pattern in conservative thought, this fixation on children and how they should be raised? What understanding of the world does it come from? Well, that's a complicated question, and it has a lot of answers, but I think that in a subtle way, this Leo and Layla cartoon suggests one possibility. When Leo asks Alexander Solzhenitsyn, why can't I say whatever I want in class? And Alexander responds, because you're a child and a student and have roles to fill. When you are a student, you have a responsibility to respect your teacher and not be rude. He's obviously correct. Children should be expected to behave in various ways, and there are times when I think teachers can reasonably tell them to stop doing some bad behavior. In fact, I think he's so correct that his logic continues to apply throughout a person's life. As we grow up, we stop being students, stop what? being the sort of people who can be scolded or disciplined by teachers. But we gain new responsibilities, right? That of being a neighbor, of living in a community, of working, of being in a family. We have the basic responsibility to say true, good things. But to Prager you here, childhood is the end of the story. Yes, Leo lives in a society. He can be understood as a person with responsibilities in a broader social network. But his father cannot. He is the sovereign, and no matter what the he sovereign. says, no matter how much the school board hates him, he must not face consequences. Father is very brave. He is warrior for freedom. If we wanted to understand why children are so often made the subject of conservative thought, one answer might be that children are one of the only classes of people who we can think about politically. If we pretend to think that no adult should be accountable to anybody, that they should act as free agents, unburdened by the expectations of others, then children become the only vehicle through which power can be expressed. And so, that power must be total. Children cannot hear the wrong facts, they cannot think about the wrong stories, cannot experience the wrong people. They must believe in a mythical version of American history, must think that power is and always has been just. They must obey their parents, and they should watch PragerU for kids. Because if we can't exert control now, when can we? Hmm. So I know what you're thinking. Okay. Sure, conservative propaganda for children might be bad, but I long to see more of it. 
I'm a crazy <laughs> little guy and I need more content. Well, I think I have your answer and it's a little streaming service called Nebula. Oh, Every month for the Hey, hey, he's doing the big money salvia thing where it's like, oh, well, it, I didn't even know I was being advertised to. Do you enjoy the surfs but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs? Many are saying this. Well, we've got the solution for you. It's the Surf Times in podcast form. Available on most major podcasting networks now. If you enjoy it, please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out, apparently, and it's free. Just like the podcast. To our gods, Xander Corvus and Peyton L. Just, we are prepared to conduct many a human sacrifices in your honor. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we are but your humble yet incompetent gestures, trying in vain to bring some levity into your life. To our lord, Trevor R., we give you thanks for this meager plot of land for us to toil away our pathetic existence. To our brave knights, Carl Wauer, Tony, DM Rivera, Resident Scarecrow, Sir Nickus, Mayred, Cheryl Alvarez, Ruben Kelly, Brandon, Words Greenwood, Nate, Hagbird Celine, Matthew Scarborough, Stellar Vision, Ariane McCarthy, Daniel Sutton, Coulter Smith, Jenna Tal, Quiet185, Anna Loves Riley, Omni, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, The Tim Caucus, Multimondi, Trevor Janis, Lemmy101, Anthropophojack, Saren42, Catherine, Ramon Acosta, Incosin, Agent NDN, Violent Orchard, Political Puppy, Andreas Chiringuito, Zach Christensen, Todd Buckingham, and Todd Lajeunesse. We salute our mighty heroes off to conquest some bread in some far-off lands.